as our head office, but we also work in partnership with um, Gateshead Recovery Partnership and Stockton Recovery Service. Um, and we also have a set of four social enterprise businesses, um, which within all of them run a volunteering uh, training and work experience program for people um, across the Tees Valley, uh, which is why I thought that this particular um, breakout room would be really useful for us. Um, we've done a bit of research into um, minority communities um, yeah. and also people, because of the vulnerable people we support, um, there are people who have been through the prison system and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, look forward to hearing what we all chat about and thank you very much for having me. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Did you want me to nominate someone else, did you say, Johnny? Yeah, yeah, please. Um, Kate McDonald. Yeah, hi, I'm Kate McDonald and I'm in Hull, East Riding and East Riding of Yorkshire. So we I run the Time Bank, which is um, covers the, the whole region. And we also have a mutual aid hub in which we're, um, well, we're exploring becoming a sort of co-op development organization so moving in that direction yeah nominate and i'll nominate anna thorne Hi, I'm Anna and um, I'm from Oxford and I've just recently started in post as a community wealth building project coordinator for a new project that's a partnership between um, community action groups Oxfordshire, uh, the city council and some other partners, very important partners as well um, and uh, we're, we're setting up a project, the project's being called Owned by Oxford and i um, really interested to hear what's been happening because I think yeah, the model is, is very much um, going to be informed by the learning that you're sharing. So, really excited. Thank you. Well, thanks, Anna. And nominate somebody. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Elaine. Hi, um, I'm Elaine. I am the founder and CEO of Phoenix Cultural Centre and Fiery Bird Music Venue in Woking. And we do outreach. We we're, we've taken 10 years to finally get a building from the council and we're going to have an acoustic arts cafe in it upstairs for all ages and the traditional type of live music venue and all the money goes back into um, work with disadvantaged uh, people of, uh, of all types and backgrounds and that's where we are and I nominate um, Anna Thurkettle. Hiya, uh, I'm Anna, I'm currently in Camden um, I work at Likewise, we're a mental health and well-being uh, charity supporting vulnerable adults um, and we're, I've, I've just recently taken on position as community lead um, and just looking at how we reland the kind of community strand of our work and how we can do that in a little bit more of an intentional and um, open way than what we were doing before so um, yeah looking forward to hearing what everyone's got to say and I'll nominate Azzy. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Azzy, Azzy Arman. I am a trustee at a um, London-based um, charity called Refugee Cafe. Uh, our mission is to train and upskill um, refugees, um, our beneficiaries, so that in hospitality and catering so that they can live an equitable living and many of our um, beneficiaries uh, tend to want to run have their own businesses after their training so this is going to be really useful for me i'm also a member of uh, um, london donut economics action lab uh, which is based on donut economics and and uh, we are about to um review some of our findings and fire up some projects and again this could be very useful for that as well thank you and i will nominate oh what have i got on my screen um graham williams you're on mute graham <laughs> Yeah, that helped, isn't it? <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, my name's Graham Williams. I, uh, I'm based in Newcastle, uh, in the centre of the city. Um, I am the uh, partnership director for a charity called Centre West, is a, a, 
the uh, organisation that uh, aims to regenerate the West End of Newcastle. Um, for the last five years, we've been involved with a group of local people to reopen a local swimming pool and leisure centre. Uh, it, it reopened just before COVID uh, in September 2019, um, and it's working very well commercially. Um, but after five years of campaigning and finally getting the business running, we need to look at the governance structure and particularly the participation of, or greater participation of the local Asian community, which probably forms something like half the population of the area that it's uh, Wow. Well, great. Thank you, Graham. And you nominate? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll have to have a look because everybody on my screen has been on. Uh, uh, Gian Pietro. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gian Pietro and I'm based in London and I'm the co-founder and co-director of Appimaps that is a social impact aggregator platform that uh, support the connection, the, the discovery and the create of magic and action uh, between uh, uh, the community and individuals with social impact uh, places and uh, an organization and using maps, apps and tours and uh yeah communication is a big part because it's about building bridges so that's why i was so keen to to participate today and um i'm not gonna nominate uh roxy piper hi yeah <laughs> um yes yeah, so i'm i'm here um uh on behalf of new prosperity devon um we're looking at community wealth building um, project so hopefully we'll be um, partnering with some people really inspired by the CAG Oxfordshire um, model. Um, I also work with Thriving Timmer for a, a new community group uh, looking to apply some of these great um, community wealth building approaches and uh, asset-based community development in Timmer um, and also part of the Devon Donut Collective doing uh, citizen-led engagement um, with local authorities and um, just uh, the community. Um, and I will pass to Carly. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carly Harper. I work for a not for profit called Carbon Co op, and we are just about to launch a project in Oldham called Oldham Energy Futures. Um, and that is based around. Um, helping communities reduce their carbon consumption and looking at how we can support planning moving forward with local authorities and uh, housing associations to also um, support carbon reduction within communities. So we're working with two um, neighbourhoods within Oldham that are quite high in the deprivation index. So obviously come with their own challenges around making choices, which can be um, usually have a cost attached to them. <laughs> and the project aims to spark conversations and also has some seed funding for community-led, community-based projects with the hope of them um, generating the spark, the conversation and hopefully some um, green jobs from the um, scheme. And I believe, thank you Carly, I believe it's just Sarah Buchanan. Oh, yeah. Hi, and I think Jade. And Jade as well, yeah. Just yeah, so <laughs> should I go first? Um, thanks, yeah. So my name's Sarah Buchanan. So I'm uh, based just outside Bath. Um, I'm currently supporting Power to Change with uh, the delivery of uh, a capacity support programme called Powering Up. Uh, previously, I've um, headed up the early stage programmes for Power to Change. So they're all about sort of supporting pre-venture community businesses. So I've always been really interested in how as a funder, um, we have more sort of outreach or I loved your phrase, in reach Johnny, um, to communities that might not traditionally have uh, applied for funding and support from Power to Change. Um, and I think it's always been a big challenge. So I'm always really keen to, to learn, um, yeah, how to improve that reach. And I think the the cultural change is, is really interesting and, and overcoming um, sort of just, yeah, knowledge awareness issues. So, yeah, and, and obviously language and all sorts of other barriers that might be there. Um, so, yeah, really interested to join your working group and, and, and learn. So, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'll pass to Jade. 
Hi, I'm Jade. Um, I work for the Wharton Trust in Hartlepool. Um, we've got a number of community businesses active at the moment, and I'm just interested in what everyone else is doing um, and what other community anchor organisations are up to. Brilliant. Cool, thank you. So, yeah, we've got, we've, we've got half an hour. I want to keep it as discurf, discursive as possible. Um, you know, we're here with a little bit of experience, but you know, there's, there's loads of experience in the room as well. Um, and that's the kind of the main purpose of these calls. But yeah, um, Nita, did you want to talk a bit about your experience of being kind of invited into the programme, oh. both in terms of translation, but I guess more broadly from that as well? Um, about your yeah. cultural role in the city and communities you work in and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, firstly, it's so lovely to meet all of you um, virtually and some amazing projects that are going on. And uh, what stood out to me essentially in, in all of your conversations was the fact that you want to communicate with um, a diverse audience, in particular the Bain community um, who you know represent our, our diverse UK. And um, throughout the years, I've worked, I, I, I've kind of been, I would say, the voice of. Um, the South Asian community in particular, who have found it really difficult to perhaps learn about different projects, learn about different facilities, learn about different organizations. And it's simply because um, of language barriers. Now, when I came into the co-op, um, I was so impressed by, I was so touched by the willingness of wanting to translate and wanting to reach out. And the reason I was, surprised or touched was because I don't think many of the pe members of the being community even realize that there is communities who want to reach out so I think that's one of the first steps is understanding that yes we do want uh, diverse people to we do want people from the being community to work with us we do want to adjust our resources and we do want to reach out so I think that's step number one um just showing that general interest and um and that, and one of the questions came to me is, how do we reach out to uh, small pockets of community who are so hard to reach? Um, and one of the key ways that I have found is connecting with your local faith centers. And why the faith centers is because in that community, they are able to break down um, a language barriers and they have a huge database of uh, people in the local community who perhaps don't get, get out but do get involved in a place where they feel culturally accepted and they have they are able to make conversations and that's that's a really really important point because I, I, I had during COVID I think it's been highlighted more where um, you know it's it, the communication gap has been so huge that cases have risen because of simple communication. And this is where I believe businesses or organization or community or heads can reach out. Um, and again, you've got uh, the, the other different, um, even within the, the Bain community or the actual um, South Asian community, you've got issues where women may not even be um women might feel uncomfortable in a situation where there's mixed there's a mixed audience they might not want to access your facilities because you know they don't know um a who's going to be presenting it b of course i keep talking about language barriers because i think that's one of the biggest biggest things and and c you know sometimes there is that risk of oh is this just a tick box exercise you know uh, and that can be picked up really really quickly it's about and just a making the effort to understand who your community is because i know graham you were saying in your area in where you are predominantly it's a big south asian community but how do you get involved with this community and and then what, what i've done is um i've always invited um members who are uh, members of or heads of community to a diwali festival or an eid festival or a Vasaki festival or just turning up um, and taking part in these in these cultural activities to to introduce yourself to this community and that's where your connection really begins and even for example if you've got a facebook page if you've got a general leaflet marketing material to change it to a universal language which is or change it to a language where 
a Gujarati community or a, um, or a, a, you know, even if you're writing in Arabic, your reach to a Muslim community or a Punjabi community is much more. Um, and these are just the, the small tips, like for example, the Preston model was translated in Gujarati and um, Gujarati and Urdu because the, 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 the community in Lancashire mainly speak Gujarati and, um, Gujarati and um, Urdu, whereas in Oxford or in London or in Newcastle, it might be Punjabi or it might be another language, but these are just the small, these are just really, really basic small changes to start connecting and reaching out to a wider audience who will, who will just latch on like that. And I say that with utmost confidence because I know the community, I work with them day in, day out, and they tell me, you know, we really want to do this, we really want to do that, but we, we feel inadequate because sometimes we don't understand or uh, you know and we feel like it's um and that's the, your, that's your first barrier and it's just it and you know it's not that they don't want to participate the community don't want to participate you, you will find that most communities will stick with their own community is because like we said they, it, it's it's conf it's lacking confidence in be, being able to communicate and i think the you know i i truly believe the first beginning is just to go out into the community and start beginning by translating small things to make your work accessible and make it more um you know diversely friendly if you will um and, and and these are the small things i i really believe have have worked um and, and have been so powerful um so what i want to do is essentially take all your questions and all your barriers and see if i can address them and this was just a small introduction of of what i do and what my learnings are uh, you know, I've, I've I've now worked with um, with the vaccination. To, just to really quickly summar, uh, summarize what I'm saying, I'm now working alongside um, Preston City Council community champions to start translating um, those with vaccination hesitancy, producing videos in different languages to remove that myth, and also the the hesitancy to actually come to a vaccination centre. Women who, you know, my grandmother, for example, wears a sari. And she's mortified at the fact of taking her sari off in front of a man. So she's like, I won't take my, I won't take my, in, I won't take my vaccination. And can you imagine they will compromise? Some women will, or, or men will even compromise um, their vaccinations because of these cultural barriers. Um, so um, it's, it's addressing that. So now there's a short video explaining in different languages saying if you require a female to take your vaccination uh, or you just want it in a private area, this can be catered to. If we can reduce vaccination hesitancy, then um, these are the small changes we're willing to make and um, create funding for. So yeah, this is me. Um, I hope that helped and I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to your questions. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Nitao. I can see that Emily, um, yeah, would like to would like to jump in. Over to you. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Nitao. It was really interesting to hear. And it was just a lot of the stuff that you were saying really echoes in what we're doing as a charity at the moment. I mean, like I said, we um, specialise in substance use recovery. Um, and where we're mainly based in Middlesbrough, um, there is a large BAME population, and um, that's well known about Middlesbrough. Um, but we had noticed, especially over the past couple of years, that a lot of the people who were coming into the rehab, accessing our programmes, were white, were usually British. There was, you know, there was some BAME communities that would come in, but it was mainly white British people. And we oh. knew that our audience was much broader than that. Um, so our CEO actually um, commissioned a little bit of research um, with, um, you may recognise his name, his name's Idris Rashid. Have yes. you ever heard his name before? Um, we did yeah. a bit of research with him, um, working with, like you were saying, um, people like leaders in, in the faith groups and also um, community representatives from every um, aspect of the community. Um, which was a really successful project. I, mean, I, I believe in one of the centres, they still um, talk about addiction and recovery every Friday during prayer. Um, and for us, that's massive because, you know, we're aware that there's a lot of stigma and there's a lot of shame associated with addictions um, within those communities, which was, you know, when we were talking to them, they were saying, you know, that that is a massive barrier into recovery because people just do not want 
to have that associated with themselves so they suffer in silence um and the massive thing for us again is that since that research which i think was like the middle of last year um we currently have um seven people in our rehab but i believe at least five of them um are of the BAME community um and that's never it gives me like it gives me goosebumps talking about it because it yeah. you know when you it just proves really i just wanted to mention it for everyone really because it sort of proves that exactly like Nita was saying if you make the effort and the, the conscious decision to make sure that you're reaching every bit of the community that you provide a service for that those people will respond it's just that you may have to change the way that you communicate whether that's in language whether that is um, targeting faith groups you know talking to people that they already trust to get them to trust you to feed that message down um, i mean all of the services we're providing are so important um and sometimes it can be that it just takes that little bit of it just takes for you to diversify what you do um to reach those people because everybody needs that support but yeah just when you were talking it just really made me want to mention that so yeah and thank, look, you. thank you so much i think that's absolutely fantastic and you've hit the nail on the head emily um you know of course with uh, and it's, it's a known fact that uh, there's so much stigma attached to having conversations about mental well-being mental health um and it's that gentleness i always refer back to this gentleness in how you communicate um whether it's through um whether it's written whether it's this post or whether the way you speak um and 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 that will that will immediately drop barriers just like that so thank you so much for sharing that emily i really appreciate that oh, thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Oh, thank you both. Um, yeah, I just put in the chat any more questions or points that people might want to talk to either from their own experience, kind of good practice, good partnership working or, or a particular challenge? Yes, Graham. Yeah, just to come back on, on what you said uh, earlier on, uh, uh, Natal, um, we, we, ha we don't have a problem with uh, the customer base. Um, Around about half the population is Asian in, in the local area of the pool, and probably that's more than represented as far as the people who use it, you know, um, particularly when we started the women's only sessions and things like that. Um, and we also have very good representation as far as our customers are concerned from the disabled community as well, because it's the only yeah. show pool in Newcastle. That the, and we, we've also got senior managers who are uh, from that community. Um, it's kind of it's the perennial problem, I think, of trying to get people involved in the management and, and actually on the board of, of the organisation that I'm working with that I've, we found quite difficult. You know, we've got good communications with the local mosques. We've got over 5,000 people on the local Facebook, followers on Facebook. Wow. Um, but there's, there's been this ongoing problem that we've had, if you like, of being able to empower people and make them confident enough to join our board. That, that, that's the kind of uh, issue we've got. Um, and it's generally a governance issue as well of what do we do with a sustainable business that you know it's turned over about half a million pounds now going forward um how do we sustain that because we've got local it's it's difficult enough to get a lot of people to volunteer to to manage the board it's a lot of work um do we start looking at partially a, a workers cooperative and uh, local people joining the board and that's the, the kind of dilemmas that we're facing at the moment so sorry Brian. so just to, to understand more flesh to the to the you know the outline i give earlier on if you like yeah i, I mean sorry Brian. so just to understand it's um yeah. it's, it's not more so about connecting to the local community no, it's more not. yeah so you've got that wonderful connection already it's more so about the manage is it more so about the management it is. Uh, it's, it's empowering people and make people comfortable enough to actually come forward to, to, to take the next step, if you like, you know. Ah, so how interesting. So, um, I mean, let me get back to you with that one, Graham, because I think that's a really interesting point because um, it, it, it's understand the reluctance to or, or wanting to move forward. And, uh, you know, and I know Azi Arman talked about upskilling and um upskilling and, and and empowering um the that particular community um to um to manage or to become part of a team and and maybe it, it, that's where that's where the small gap perhaps be it, it perhaps is and uh, doing a court where you're upskilling and and doing 
role play or scenario based where this this kind of level of uh, you know if you are in this position how would it be how can you improve and uh, and maybe it is it's got to do with that confidence factor um which is uh, which could act as a barrier but let me get back to you i think i need a i need a more of a proper answer to give to you graham um to help me with that but i think that was really interesting thank you for sharing that um and i will come i will uh, i will send you a, um just uh, just some guidance for that if that's okay graham that'd be great thank you thank yeah. you so much examples would be fantastic just to pick up on Nita's point i think yeah the skills and culture gap there is obviously really big over more kind of formal representation board positions. And that's why lots of charities are represented by former members of the private sector. For instance, if you go in any town and look at the assets, you'll find lots of people with lots of private sector experience at large banks. And, and we know how that kind of can sometimes negatively warp, you know, community assets and cultures. But yeah, that kind of skills and training to build confidence, esteem, to, to take on such such roles, I think you know, almost like the kind of development pipeline tool that we have, I think is like, what is the kind of the pipeline here for people going from a certain place to another place and what kind of support activities, training skills they need to move from there to there, um, to make it meaningful, to keep, you know, retention of, of such people in those kind of positions. Um, Sarah's jumped in with a really, a really good question, which is, does anybody have any good practice examples of more accessible application routes into funding and support programs. Um, I mean, I'll just quickly say before handing it over that, um, again, in Preston, there's some, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some co-op development funding to fund nine worker co-ops. Um, and the design of that funding program, you know, will make certain people in Preston ineligible by virtue of what the form looks like and how long it takes and so on and so forth. So there has been, some moves around like verbal applications um without doing written applications but but yeah does anybody have any kind of thoughts on on good practice within funding applications um that was necessarily funding applications i was just um thinking that um in my experience it can be to uh, to focus a lot on faith centers and faith areas can actually be quite prescriptive and actually cut people out who don't want to go through it we found it very successful using or when we were running the ESOL classes to connect with people that way especially women um, and especially people with children or, or mental health issues um, in some communities because um, there can be some faith centers in, in all all backgrounds um, there can be gatekeeper activity um, and and actually it's about it's it is harder work but it is about it's more about meeting people where they live and work and shop and the school gate and things like that in their everyday lives that speaks more to how they'll engage with something than um, necessarily something they might do once a week if at all um, because it's the assumption that people with different faiths take the same habits and behaviors of say that the, the mass population something happens once a week and they don't necessarily do that at all they may not least go through that they might live through their faith every day or or whatever um it, it is harder work but it is it, it is footwork and groundwork and 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 relentlessness um and and that's from that one time we had people who it's where there's a gap it's like the burning platform thing so um the the women's classes in the community only went up to a certain level and then if they wanted to go to the next level of English it meant going to a town 10 miles away with no childcare so the way we got around it was they constituted a group a friendship group where they could practice English and have the children looked after and stuff like that um but they actually did that themselves um so it kind of I suppose it was just that kind of engagement and developing it slowly over time and becoming um in with their inner confidence and the group safety allowed that definitely but yeah that's what i was just going to observe really and that, that, i think that's really interesting elaine as well the, the fact that you know um you were able the faith centers were so instrumental in you connecting with the um with with the being community with the south asian community in particular um and um i think they're a fantastic space 
and the faith cent most faith centers will be um so willing to um, help you connect, help you get involved. Um, I, I, you know, as part of whenever I'm training, I always say, as, whenever you do um, set up some training or want to reach out, it's just it's it's just coming across as it's a it's a genuine activity, and you'll get that connection right away. Um, I always, again, I keep saying the tick box exercise is a really dangerous territory to go to because uh, sometimes it can seem really mechanical. Um, but when, when you create these fantastic relationships with the faith centers, you open up your market or you open up your audience that much more. Um, so it's just kind of just looking at, uh, you know, um, and taking an interest and seeing what this community, what your local faith center community is doing, and just kind of getting involved, even if it's a, you know they might be having a sponsored walk or they might be um, selling cakes, anything, just trying to get involved. Um, yeah, um, that was just adding to what Elaine said. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Elaine. Cool. Can I make a comment uh, with regards to Graham's question? Yes, yes, uh, yes Elaine. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so uh, Refugee Cafe, whilst we've been defining our programme, we have uh, definitely identified that we need to provide uh, mentoring and co coaching um, capability alongside with the actual hands-on training and the experience, you know, from putting CVs together to highlighting, you know, where the capabilities of the candidates are and, and making sure that where there isn't, then we put other programs in place to bridge that um, uh, and and some of the services we we don't have and we have to reach out to partners such as breaking barriers to provide that you know be it from kind of like digital or some of the coaching and things as well but it is a very conscious effort to actually support them not only in the skill that we we provide but moreover uh, more of a supportive skill to make sure that they they're going to feel confident about themselves from within themselves in order to be able to present themselves when they go out in the big bad world yeah thanks for that i think that, oh sorry sarah sorry go ahead yeah no just to say i think that's a, a it's a really interesting point as we've um empowering up um the, the sort of capacity support program we're delivering at the moment it's it's got a mentoring um, and coaching element to it alongside the more sort of technical business development support because I think, yeah, that confidence and sort of personal development support that people need um, to be sort of successful with developing community businesses or any enterprise is so essential, isn't it? Um, but I think, um, and just, just sort of going back to the, the question I asked about reason to sort of funding and support programmes, I think the challenge I, th I feel that a lot of funders have is this application, how to make the application forms um, sort of more accessible, simple, straightforward to complete while giving sort of the information that you need to make a decision. And again, on Pairing Up, we've kind of developed a model where as, as link workers, we support people with the application. But I guess one question I, I have now is, is like, there's still no, no sort of capacity to do that in different languages. Um, and I guess that might be, again, through partnerships that is, that's why that's so valuable, I guess. Kind of, I like the time banking idea. Um, again, working with organizations that can perhaps sort of sit with people and help with that side of it. Um, or do we do away with written application forms completely? And I know it's a perennial discussion, is video better? So any other ideas around that would be great to hear. You know what, Sarah, that, that's really interesting because you're right, I mean, um, for example, if I had a client approach me um, and they've asked, you know, for a funding application to be not so much translated, but for guidance. So, for example, if we have um, somebody wants to do translation, so it's gu it's guided them how to do that um, uh, because it's the reader. You know, we could translate it, but would the reader understand it? So it's being that as a translator or interpreter, it's 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 sitting down and having that. It, it, this is how it's worked and it sounds it sounds really long but it's been almost like a one-to-one -one, uh, session where this is the application and this is what's being said um and in that way you're you are you are bridging that communication gap through um through just that one-to-one -one session of completing a funding uh, application in a different language and then articulating it back to 
whoever's looking at the funding application. So yeah, it, it, it's it's a kind of it's a long winded way um, because it, you know it's not it's a, it's about two parties, if you will, who are looking at this um, at this application. One who's filling it out and the other one. Um, who is kind of um, going to be reading it. So the only way that's worked is so far from my experience has been like a um, a one-to-one -one kind of thing. You've got the application, helping the client complete the application and then articulating it back to the, back to the team um, of what's been said and how it's been explained. Because, you know, even in an English, if it's, you know, say they are filling an application, they might not be able to express themselves or put their ideas forward in English, they might forget certain words, uh, whereas, you know, in the language, you're able to express it and someone's able to translate it back and you get the idea um, much more better. Cool. And then to, just to quickly add to that, we, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, mm -hmm. But just to add to that, we're, we're talking to Power, Power to Change at the moment, really, really early stage in the Ubelli Initiative, who have been awarded a three-year contract to deliver um, business support. But there's still a gap about how do people get onto the business support program, which is not about language, but it's about readiness. Um, and again, this just comes down to, I think, how we see, you know, funding for particular programs and where, and where you never see funding is to invest in kind of partners to recruit into programs. So even, you know, 10, 15, 20 grand to invest in a few partners in different communities that can have pay capacity to go out and do this work. Often we rely on so-called referral partnerships, which are, are voluntary and unpaid. And an organization gets an email that says, hey, do you know anyone from your community that might want to join and benefit from this program? So there's no money there. There's no funding. It's just a kind of voluntary ask. Um, but also for those that need that six months before a program starts, you know, even lightly structured programs that offer support across that time, they could be doing applications for the project as part of that but it's building their awareness around models and a whole range of things, which is not simply about being able to fill out an application form or not because of language or um, a lack of education. I think it's something which is a lot further back in the pipeline, but could satisfy, you know, that challenge as well. Um, I think, again, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to encourage a stir to action, which is six to 12 months, even before that program starts, what support are people being given to build their skills, culture and readiness to be part of that program. Yeah. Um, so, it, so again, it's patient, it's slow, it's, it, we're told it's more difficult to fund, but it does expand who actually participates when these programs are, uh, programs are offered. But, you know, stir to action, I know um, the, the, um, the, the translation that there's been, a, there's been um, a huge interest that you know just having a look at uh, look at the resources and knowing that it's available in a different language of what the objectives are what you do and how to get involved so it does make a difference it definitely does make a difference um and kudos to stay to action for 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 even um taking that first step cool so kate mcdonald kate any you, you've dropped in a couple of comments kind of around the relational aspect which is really crucial here do you want to do you want to expand on that I think really it's it's what you were saying. Uh, it's something like an, an application form. I was sort of just reflecting on this. It's it's almost like a, a, an examine how well you can do an application form, isn't it? So having that sort of relational role to like really get underneath what the you know the organisation is wanting to achieve, and then explore the needs and all of that. You're going to get a better project in the end i think so yeah. yeah i think i was just like agreeing which is why i put my hand up. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that kate uh, no, i agree i absolutely agree i think we've got about five minutes does anybody who's not kind of asked a question made a point doesn't have to be a question if you just kind of you know, want to speak to how, how you're working or any challenges you're facing I was just going to say, I think that um, the whole application process in itself can be a minefield and um, that it's, it, it just seems like the goalposts change every time you, you, re you satisfy funders. What they're saying is the gap. You go back and make the application, then it's something else, something else. So how much harder that must be for people who are also trying to get through that um, thing mm -hmm. of, you know, it's almost like you need to know the codes to get in. 
Um, and so it's so much harder there for people who don't even know the language codes to get in, but it's, it's just such a difficult, um, uh, it's such a minefield to try and get funding. You kind of feel like, oh, well, we've proved their point now, we'll go back. And then it's like, oh no, it's this now. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and it's, I, I think, I mean, what you're saying to me as well is kind of, yeah, is that it's, yeah, there's, there's often a, a change in kind of so-called theories of change within work, which, you know, funders who often kind of review, spend lots of time in workshops, and then the theory of change changes. And I think it comes back to how do we co-create and how do we involve a much broader spectrum of people in creating that theory of change rather than it being kind of academically produced mm. by a certain group of professionals and then passed on as a, as a model that everybody has to satisfy and, and align with if we're gonna see any positive economic and social change. Mm. I think also there's a lack of risk in terms of that it's very it's very well branded. A lot of it is, and it's not one particular fund. It just seems to be a general thing is that it's all very well branded as like activism and this, that, and the other. But actually, that it's waiting until you're safe and low risk, and you've got ev all your councils and your local everything backed up behind you, and you've almost almost at the point where you don't need funding. Um, is is the is the point where. It, a lot of there's a lot of that transitional thing but I mean that's a subject I suppose for another day but it's that kind of do funders wait until people are a safe bet or do they really get behind communities when they're struggling and they want change in their community because that's not often what we see at the at the sharp end yeah yeah again just going back to the relational aspect of it in a sense you, you if you build that relationship in the early stages going towards funding but then keep that and the, for me there's something really crucial here about like communities of practice and how we move like strengths-based collaboration beyond words and overcome the barriers to trust because across and between organizations because if we're going to have a systemic sort of change of culture then that building that trust and learning and uh, having a space for reflection and learning as part of the process, I think is, is crucial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, and, and I know that um, uh, Johnny said, I think we've only got about a minute left, haven't we, Johnny? Um, I just wanted to kind of, if, if I could just uh, uh, conclude everything I was saying in terms of, um, the only way to i guess reach out do you know obviously the objective of today was just to kind of identify how to reach out to your um to the diverse audience some things we can do to be more uh, culturally accessible and it is it's, it's kind of going back to the drawing board and looking at your resources and thinking okay if we trans if we look at a look at the um, how we can reach out i know some of you don't have that problem with reaching out but if you do have that problem it's about a um looking at some of your resources and see can they be translated can some of your videos come and some of your marketing material be translated to open up to a um open up to a bigger audience um could you connect with your local faith centers to make your um some of your initiatives more um open again to a diverse audience and i really like um what Azi was talking about Azi, sorry about upskilling and um you know, sometimes it's not about language but upskilling to to um develop confidence um and uh, and and participate a bit, a bit more and remove stigma of getting involved a bit more so i think that's a really really big thing and in regards to um a funding application i think we hit the nail on the head there has to be some sort of process put in place where um people will uh, perhaps may have language barriers they're able to express themselves and hit the nail on the head with uh, with some of the objectives of what they want to achieve in a funding application um so yeah i mean that's what i wanted to kind of just summarize with and um and if you think of any questions afterwards, do do send them through and I'll be happy to answer them. And Graham, I will come back with a better answer for you. No, it's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Over to you, Johnny. Oh, no, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, it looks like we'll probably have another 10, 20 minutes and when we're back in the main session. But yeah, no, thanks for everybody participation today. Um, yeah, how wonderful it might be to be in a room at some point. But, um, 
appreciate we might not have be able to get in the same room anyway, considering how, how far apart we are. Um, but yeah, if we'll put information about our Community Anchors project in positive emails. Um, and yeah, please do get in touch if, if there's any way of kind of working together. We're talking to a lot of local authorities at the moment, and it's different from the way, way necessarily that we're working in Preston. Um, but it's all about kind of patient, slow development and supporting people that have got low or no exposure to these kind of models to really be able to take part.